I wanted to revisit Joseph a little bit from last week because sometimes, you know, class will end and I'll be thinking about things afterwards. And I think, did we, did we really cover that? Or did I make a certain point clear or something like that? And this is just more about just the overall narrative of the story. If you recall Joseph, when he's in Egypt, his brothers come to get the food and he's asking about, you know, who is back home trying to find out about Benjamin. And he ends up framing Benjamin for stealing the cup. He puts a cup in his sack of grain and then sends officers to arrest them on the way out to search him. And then he's got this cup. He frames him for stealing. And so the text doesn't say what motivated Joseph to do that, like why he was doing that. So it's subtext. You could figure out what it is based on the circumstances, but it's not spelled out in the text itself. And I talked to a couple people in here about it afterwards. Does anybody know why he did that? Why did he frame Benjamin for stealing the cup? Why did Joseph frame him? The test of the brothers. Right. But why? So you could keep one so they'd come back? Yeah. So they could it, come back. Yeah. It was to see how they would react. So the last I thought, time. I thought it was to show how you can allow forgiveness. So we had this excerpt from Josephus. And he's explaining these stories to, say, a non-Jewish audience who isn't as familiar. And so there's things like subtext that the Jews would kind of have an understanding through their traditions and their teachings that even the things that aren't spelled out explicitly in the text, they had certain understandings. And so he does say that Joseph told his brothers, I did all this to try your love, to test your love to your brother, to see if the way they treated him so many years ago was the way they would still be. Is that who they are? Or was that like an exception and they've, they're not going to do that again? So the whole thing, first they show up and of course they don't recognize him, but he recognizes them. So first he's asking questions to figure out if Benjamin's even still alive. Maybe they've killed him already. Maybe they've had him shipped off to Timbuktu as well, right? They haven't seen each other for about 22 years because it says that Joseph was 17 in the chapter about the dreams and that, you know, that they resented him. And he told on a couple of his brothers. He was 17 at that time. He was 30 when he was brought before Pharaoh. And then the dream that Pharaoh had said there would be seven years of famine following seven years of plenty. And they were two years into the famine. So that's nine years. So 17 to about 39, you know, 22 years, right? It's a long time. So Benjamin, where he was a young child in the beginning of the story, now he's a young man. He's, you know, at least in his 20s. And so he first wants to establish that Benjamin is alive. So he demands that he actually bring him, right? Maybe they're even lying about him being still around. Then at the dinner, what does he do? His brothers hated him because he was favored by their father, right? He got the fancy coat and among other things. So maybe that's true. Now he's the youngest child. He's the one that's Rachel's son. So he's probably already getting special treatment. Maybe they already have a grudge against him. But just to make sure, how about at this dinner, I give him five times as much food as everybody else. That'll irritate them, right? So he's provoking them, right? So you think, oh, maybe he's just really glad to see his brother. Yeah, okay, but there's more to it than that. He says, I'm doing all this, according to Josephus, I did all this to test you. So that's a provocation. If they're not already resenting him, this may add to it or inflame their resentment. And then- That's interesting, because I, th I always thought that he gave him the extra food because he loved him, because it was his, you know, his full and white brother. Yeah. But I think you're right. Yeah. I think it was. He was I never thought about it that way. Right. It can be yeah. both. It can. It can be both. But I could almost picture him watching his brother's faces when he gets the giant, I mean, five times. Food, yeah. That's a lot of it's food. not. It's not just like, it's you know. Like one extra portion. Yeah. Like the lunch lady might give me a few extra raviolis because I'm nice to her. But they're also you know, coming for food too, and they didn't have food. Right, yeah, yeah, like five times. It's it's excessive, it's like right? It wasn't his plate was overwhelmed. His table was yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think they're going, what is going on here? You know. But then the framing, now they have an opportunity, if they want to, to get rid of this guy. So they could just go, wow, 
He stole it. Yeah, yeah it's uh. It's his fault. Now. Yeah, yeah. See you later, and, and go on their way, and go. Well, you know, he'd either be killed or imprisoned or enslaved or whatever. But instead, they totally went to bat for him. One of them said, "I'll go in his place," and he was completely satisfied. But it's the kind of thing like if you're just reading the story. Sometimes you know you can miss things, right? And then this one phrase, I did all this to test your love for your brother, it kind of makes it all all this sort of because you're reading these stories and it's you know different culture, it's a long time ago. You you don't have all the details, and sometimes you can get confused and you feel like maybe you're missing something or you're having trouble relating. Yes. He said this one thing that you clarifies that the whole Jews. story understood that understood that right. that oh man they're giving him five helpings of food Ooh, yeah they're testing him yeah so they they knew it right away whereas when i read it i'm like oh he loves his brother so that's yeah kind of and it's point, right? and it's that the text sometimes i've read things about jewish traditions and stuff where this was common like the text is almost like the sketch of the story where some of the details are oral traditions that supplement the text. And so this is, I think, a good example of that, where it's like, if two people read the story and one person interprets it, oh, he just missed his brother and he was so happy to see him, he gave him five times as much food. And someone else can say, well, he was actually doing it to provoke his brothers to see if it might stoke resentment from them that they would betray him later when they got the chance. And this is kind of like a little bit of a tiebreaker. You've got someone 2000 years ago explaining to people like us who are like non-Jews, what this story is about. So it's kind of neat. Let's not to say that this would be infallible, but it, I think, provides a good bit of insight. And in this case, but yeah, this is not scripture. Right, right. But I think this one phrase, like it doesn't matter who it came from, but once you get that insight, then you look at it from that perspective. Now all the pieces kind of fit, whereas things are a little confusing before that. First, he's really nice to Benjamin, and then he's framing him for a crime. Like that's, that's weird, unless you understand why he's doing it. So anyway, I just wanted to double back on that and talk about that. Yeah. We don't talk that a lot, but I mean, I got a lot of brothers. And if you read the, you can read the text, that Joseph's kind of a jerk. Yeah, right. And he was. He also accuses them of being spies. He knows they're not spies. He's, he's, he's young, being he's manipulative. Yeah. 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 Yeah, but with a purpose, like he's manipulating the situation to see how they're going to react. It's not just to make them squirm and yeah.